Good morning. I want to invite you to open your Bibles to Revelation chapter 1. Uh, there are some things I've been coming accustomed to. Uh, during communion, there's a lot of noise now, right? And people are <laughs> popping their juice cups open. There's a lot of things I've become accustomed to during this pandemic. One, but one of them is not this thing right here. I noticed that Walmart is actually selling shirts now with masking, uh, matching masks. Have you seen that? I wanted to rip it off of the thing the other day and just throw it in the trash. I mean to tell you. But anyway, it is what it is. We'll keep doing what we have to do until the time comes when we're going to be like Paul on the road to demask us, right? So that's good stuff. Come on now. <laughs> All right. So here we are. Book of Revelation. Chapter 1, I'm going to read verses 4 through 7, and then we're going to do our proclamation together, and we're going to read together verse 7 by itself. But let me share with you verses 4 through 7, and then we'll read together, and it'll be on the screen here in just a little bit, verse 7 by itself. I, John... To the seven churches in the province of Asia, grace and peace to you from him who is and who was and who is to come, and from the seven spirits before his throne, and from Jesus Christ who is the faithful witness, the firstborn from the dead, and the ruler of the kings of the earth. To him who has love, who, to him who loves us, and has freed us from our sins by his blood, and has made us to be a kingdom and priests to serve his God and Father. To him be glory and power forever and ever. Amen. Look, he is coming with us, the clouds, and every eye will see him, even those who pierced him, and all peoples on earth will mourn because of him, so shall it be. Amen. Our Father and our God in heaven, we truly thank you for your holy word. And we thank you for this veil that's going to be lifted for us today as we look into the book of Revelation and we see Jesus for who he is today and how he reigns in heaven above. And Father, how one day he will come in the clouds to bring his children home. And Lord God, we are so thankful and we have this hope in our hearts that we are looking forward to the coming of the Messiah, the Christ, Jesus our Lord. And we thank you for this word in his holy name. Amen. To tell the truth, do you remember that TV show? Long years ago, it ran continuously from 1956 to 1978. And uh, for a period of time, they had some reruns of it, and they also had a, a rebirth of it. But the, the idea of the show was four celebrity panelists are presented with three contestants, and their job is to identify who the real person is. And the central character in the story, the moderator would read... Uh, something that they had done or something that they were doing. And then what would happen is they had three people, three, three people, and two of them were imposters. Now the imposters were allowed to tell lies as the panelists asked questions. But the real person had to tell the truth. And you remember how the show always ended, will the real please stand up? Well, today's message, Lifting the Veil, is taken directly from the word revelation, which literally means unveiling. And today we're going to allow the scriptures to tell the truth about Jesus. We are going to expose the imposters and ask, will the real Jesus please stand up? Many of us have a particular view of Jesus which may or may not be totally accurate. So we come to this book which lifts the veil and allows us to clearly see 
the resurrected, ascended, and now coronated Christ Jesus in all of his glory. You know, we stated last week that this world is in trouble. We need help. And we stated last week that a hero is coming. And as Christians, we know that Jesus is that hero, but sometimes our view of Jesus is not all that it should be. The danger is that in many of us are tempted to look elsewhere for help and comfort. Often, we're disappointed by the things of the world. Now, because we've avoided a study in the book of Revelation, we, we kind of unmasked some of that last week. Some of us had fears about the book of Revelation with all of its imagery, and it was hard to understand, and some of it was difficult to even deal with, and so we just choose not to read it. But because of our, we've avoided study in the book of Revelation, most of what we know about Jesus comes from the Gospels. And I frequently find myself running back to the Gospel of John, to Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. I, I love the Gospels. And in the Gospels, Jesus taught about the kingdom of God. He healed the sick. He calmed the seas. He walked on water. He fed the hungry. And He raised the dead. And some have a, a view of Jesus because of the Gospels that He was a mild-mannered do-gooder, great to have as a friend, but not so good in a fight. When Jesus came the first time, He came as a helpless baby in a manger. He needed to be cared for and to look after. In the movie Talladega Nights, Ricky Bobby exclaims after he prays to baby Jesus, here's what he says, I don't like the grown-up version of Jesus. I like the baby Jesus better. You know, many people are like that. They have a view of Jesus that they can handle. Some groups still picture Jesus on the cross, refusing to take Him down. I've told you the story about my nephew, Matthew Bergevin, who is a, was a private in the Marine Corps. We have a Marine with us today, our guest. I don't want to embarrass you, but my dad's a retired Master Gunnery Sergeant in the Marine Corps, and my, my nephew is in the Marine Corps. I love the Marines, and I'm glad you're here, Jim. It's good to have you in June. It's good to have you with us as well. And so God bless you for your service. Thank you for being here with us. But my, my nephew, uh, when he was a private, he served the chaplain in the Marine Corps. And his job, his one job, was to take the Jesus off of the cross after the Roman Catholic service to make ready for the Protestant service. Some people want to have Jesus where they can handle Him. People want to keep Him in the manger or on the cross where they can get a hold of Him and handle Him and make Him out to what they want Him to be. But I'm going to share with you this morning that Jesus is not in the manger. He's not on the cross. And He's not in the grave anymore. He suffered the cross and He paid the penalty for our sins. He descended into Hades. And He rose from the dead. And He has ascended into heaven. He was coronated with all kingly power and glory. And He now sits at the right hand of God the Father where He's waiting for God the Father to say, Son, go get My children. And I'm waiting for Him to come and I hope you are too. Even so, Lord Jesus, come quickly even today for we are truly standing on holy ground as we open the Scriptures and we look into the book of Revelation and we see the resurrected, coronated, almighty God of the universe in the person of Jesus Christ. Jesus can't be handled. He can't be put in a box. He can't be made to do what we want Him to do. He is Lord of all. He's our superhero, isn't He? But sometimes people mistakenly view Jesus like Mr. Rogers and less like the cosmic hero that he is. Now, I love superheroes. I like action movies. I'm an Arnold Schwarzenegger fan, as you know. I like Rocky. Uh, in fact, the, the, the original, to me, the original action hero, superhero was Chuck Norris. Who, who remembers Chuck Norris? You know he's 80 years old now? Man, I can't even believe it. 
But there used to be some Chuck Norris jokes going around. You guys remember that the jokes like, uh, you know, when Chuck Norris is, does a push-up, uh, he doesn't move up, the earth moves down. You remember those? They're kind of funny. Well, I got a few of them to remind you. There's hundreds of them. I'm not going to read a hundred of them, but I'm going to read a few of them. Chuck Norris doesn't read books. He stares them down until they give him the information he wants. The dinosaurs looked at Chuck Norris wrong once. <laughs> we know what happened to them. Did you know that Chuck Norris's tears can cure cancer? Too bad he never cries. Once a cobra bit Chuck Norris, after five days of excruciating pain, the cobra died. <laughs> When the boogeyman goes to sleep every night, he checks his closet for Chuck Norris. I like that one. Death had a near Chuck Norris experience. When Chuck Norris enters a room, he doesn't turn the lights on, he turns the dark off. I mean, this guy's tough, right? I love it. Chuck Norris doesn't wear a watch. He decides what time it is. A lot, this sounds like Jesus, doesn't it? When Chuck Norris was born, the only person who cried was the doctor. Don't ever slap Chuck Norris. I like this one. Superman sleeps on Chuck Norris sheets. <laughs> Did you know that Chuck Norris's belly button is an actual power outlet? I like this one. Chuck Norris's cowboy boots are made from real cowboys. <laughs> now that's good. Come on, you got to love that. And then the new one out now, Chuck Norris was exposed to the coronavirus. The virus is now in quarantine for a month. I love it. Here's the point. We often ascribe attributes that belong to Jesus to fictional characters. Why? Uh, we want somebody to rush in and save the day. We want a superhero. We need to believe that somebody can handle the mess that we call the world today. And Jesus is that someone, but sometimes we have this wrong view of Jesus. In the Chronicles of Narnia, Aslan asked of the lion, is he quite safe? The answer came back, of course he's not safe. But he's good. He is the king, I tell you. You see, Jesus is the Lion of Judah. He is the King of kings and Lord of lords. He's not safe, but he's good. You can't put him in a box. You can't handle him. You can't deal with him. He is Lord of lords. He is all-powerful. He's not safe, but he's good. I want to share with you that being a Christian isn't safe. There are parts in the world, and has been since the Lord ascended into heaven, there's parts in the world where Christians are persecuted in ways that we cannot even imagine. We've gotten a glimpse of it in our uh, media-crazed world today. We've seen more of what happens to people when they stand in opposition to darkness than we've ever seen before. And it, it, it sickens our hearts, it breaks our hearts, and, and we say, oh Lord, you know, do something, please, Lord Jesus, come quickly. And we see as, as, as our country, as our nation is beginning to slip further and further away from God and further into the depths of darkness, and we begin to see this brazen attack on Christians and their values and who they are and what they believe, uh, and to be called a Christian now is almost synonymous with being a bigot or some other uh, derogatory remark being a Christian isn't safe but we are saved from this world by our hero and while we are here we need to be faithful and if we get a clear vision of who Jesus Christ is we can have a, 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 this, this welling up of, of courage to stand firm for what Jesus stands for and what we know is the truth of the gospel of Jesus Christ. Be ye holy, for I am holy, the Bible says. We understand that there is sin and there is a penalty for sin. But Jesus' death on the cross is not 
a, a credit card. Grace is not a credit card for us to continue to sin or to cozy up to the world. We need to stand. And when we stand, we're going to be persecuted. And we're going to be attacked for our beliefs. And so we all have a choice. And we'll deal with a choice next week. But today, what we're going to do is just simply look at one point now, you guys know I usually have 37 subpoints, but we're going to look at one point, and the one point is we're going to look at the Christ. We're going to look at the Christ as he's revealed in the book of Revelation. I'm going to pick up in Revelation chapter 8, I mean, chapter 1, verses 8 through 11, and then we're going to break down this passage. Revelation chapter 1, beginning in verse 8. I am the Alpha and the Omega, says the Lord, who is and who was and who is to come, the Almighty. I, John, your brother and companion in suffering and kingdom and patient endurance that are ours in Jesus, was on the island of Patmos because of the word of God and the testimony of Jesus. On the Lord's day, I was in the Spirit, and I heard behind me a loud voice like a trumpet which said, Write on a scroll what you see, and send it to the seven churches, to Ephesus, Smyrna, Pergamum, Thyatira, Sardis, Philadelphia, and Laodicea. John was on the Isle of Patmos, as we know, exiled there because of the testimony that he was giving about Jesus Christ, that Jesus is Lord. That was the testimony of the early church. Jesus is Lord. And there was only one Lord. And of course, we know that Domitian was requiring people to call him not only Lord, but Lord and God. He was the first emperor of Rome who decided that it was he was not going to wait to be deified. After he died, he wanted to be recognized as a deity while he was alive. And the testimony of the early church and the testimony of the church in 2021 is the same. Jesus is Lord. There are no other gods. Jesus is God and Jesus alone. He is whom we worship. He is who we bow to. We have no other gods before the God of heaven. And when John turns around to see where the voice is coming from, he sees what Jesus really looks like. Wouldn't you love to see Jesus in his fully resurrected, coronated, glorified self? John got a glimpse. You and I are going to get a glimpse. One day we shall see him face to face. And the Bible says we shall know what we will be, for we shall see him for what he is. And in verse 12 it says, I turned around to see the voice that was speaking to me. And when I turned, I saw seven golden lampstands. Now we're going to break it down. We're going to take these symbols apart all through this study. Now, Jesus sees seven golden lampstands that represent the seven churches of Asia Minor. Their light is burnt. They're lit. They're not, uh, they're, uh, their lampstand is not under a basket. It's out there for all to see. The number seven in the, is symbolic of completeness. In other words, these seven churches are representative of all the churches. And so when we read this, we can read it as if Jesus is writing this epistle to us. Verse 13, And among the lampstands was someone like a son of man, dressed in a robe, reaching down to his feet, with a golden sash around his chest. Now I'm going to break this little passage down, that verse down right now. When Jesus uh, was walking the earth... He had a sermon that he preached just about everywhere he went. Now, he did a lot of teaching, but he had a central message. And in all of his uh, preachings and teachings, uh, there was a central message that emerged. And in Mark chapter 1, verses 14 through 15, we can see sort of the outline of Jesus' preaching. It says that Jesus came into Galilee proclaiming the gospel of God and saying, the time is fulfilled and the kingdom of God is at hand. Repent and believe in the gospel. Now we tend to think, and I've been taught, and I was taught in Sunday school, 
what the synopsis of the gospel is. It's the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ. And that's what we believe. And that is central to the gospel. But that's not all of the gospel in its entirety. Those three truths are true, but there is more to the gospel. The gospel has always been connected to the king and the kingdom of God. Jesus is the king, the king of all kings, and he's the Lord of all lords. King Jesus received his crown on the cross, both literally in the crown of thorns, but also figuratively. But his coronation wasn't until 40 days after his death, burial, and resurrection. And what's amazing about the coronation of Jesus is that we actually get to see two perspectives of this event. We get to see an earthly perspective, which is recorded in Acts chapter 1, but there's also a heavenly perspective. So from us, like the apostles watching Jesus ascend into heaven, we get that view in Acts chapter 1. But in Daniel's prophecy, in Daniel chapter 7, we actually get to see what it looked like from heaven. And so we're going to look at that here in just a minute. But let's take a look um, first at, at the view from earth as Jesus ascended and ultimately was coronated in heaven. Acts chapter 1 and verse 9. And when he, speaking of Jesus, said these things, as they were looking on, he was lifted up and a cloud took him out of their sight. Now that's a wonderful sight to see. It must have been an amazing sight to see. Uh, because those disciples that were standing by watching Jesus being lifted by a cloud and then disappearing into the clouds, they didn't even recognize that there were two radiant angels standing nearby. And those angelic messengers reminded the disciples as they were standing, gazing into the heavens, that Jesus is going to return in the same way that they saw him go and now so that was the earthly perspective now what we're going to do is we're going to look at the heavenly perspective what did that sight look like from heaven and daniel 600 years before the birth of christ gives us a view from heaven in his prophetic message in daniel chapter 7 and verse 13 and here's what he says. And see if you can hear some familiar words and some familiar sights could pop into your head as I read this. And it'll be on the screen as well. I saw in the night visions, and behold, with the clouds of heaven, there came one like the Son of Man. And he came to the Ancient of Days and was presented before him. And to him was given dominion and glory and a kingdom that all peoples nations and languages should serve him his dominion is an everlasting dominion which shall not pass away and his kingdom one that shall not be destroyed i hope you like clouds because there's some clouds in heaven and there's those pretty puffy white ones that you guys you know i love those against the blue sky great day sun shining puffy oh i love that there's going to be some clouds in heaven the cloud that took him out of the sight of the apostles took him to the ancient of days who's the ancient of days well that's a metaphor for god the father where he was given dominion glory and a kingdom he's a king he was coronated on that day that he rose from the earth and he ascended into heaven and as our king, he has all authority, all dominion. And whether people on earth choose to give to him all the glory that he deserves, today, one day, the Bible says everyone will give him the glory that he deserves. My Bible says, and your Bible says, that every knee shall bow and every tongue will confess that Jesus is Lord to the glory of God. He is king. He's the Lord of Lords, and he's the King of Kings. And so today, today, Jesus has set aside, you see, those simple garments of a, of a carpenter. Uh, he set aside that, that meek, uh, mild, 
Uh, he came, if you think about it, when he came to earth the first time, he came with one purpose. Now, he did a lot of things while he was here. He performed miracles, which proved who he was. And he did heal the sick and the blind, and he did all of those things, and he walked on water, and he fed the five thousand. He did all of that. That's wonderful. But that's not why he came. He came for one purpose. He came to die for you and for me. And he's accomplished that. That's already happened. And now when he's coronated, he has returned to heaven. He's the conquering king. And he's given all glory and honor in heaven in all authority. He is the sovereign, almighty king of the universe. Verse 14, his head and hair were white like snow or white like wool, as white as snow, and his eyes were like blazing fire. Now, Jesus' white hair is not a mark of frailty like some of us. I've got white hair now, so I can talk about us, right? Uh, no, it wasn't a mark of frailty. It was a mark and a symbol of deity and dignity he is regal and wise and is respected and his eyes were like a blazing fire and the idea is that he could see through his eyes can pierce through our shams and our hypocrisies and our lies and our masks that we wear both figurative literally now but figuratively all the time we only let people see who we want them to see but jesus sees through all that veneer he sees through all of that phoniness and the shams and the hypocrisy and he looks down into our souls and he sees us for who we are his eyes were like blazing fire verse 15 his feet were like bronze glowing in a furnace and his voice was like the sound of rushing waters well that's interesting what's that all about well his feet like bronze glowing in a furnace represent his strength and his stability he will not stumble he will not trip he will not falter he will stand firm solid immovable there's a theological term called God's immutability he cannot change Jesus is not wishy-washy change in his mind moving in and out of gray areas and dark areas and light areas he is solid he is clear don't you love it when people you know where you stand with somebody you can know where you stand with Jesus he's absolutely solid where he stands He's not confused. We're the ones who get confused at times. And his voice was like the sound of rushing waters. This is the same expression that the prophet Ezekiel used to describe the voice and the sound of God in the Old Testament. Ezekiel 43, 2. And I saw the glory of the God of Israel coming from the east. His voice was like the roar of rushing waters and the land was radiant with his glory. I've never been to Niagara Falls. I'd love to go. So, anybody been to Niagara Falls? My mother went. She came back. She told me. She said, Mike, it sounded like God's voice. It was so powerful. Uh, the, that amount of water uh, falling that distance and crashing against the rocks. And it was this continuous roaring sound. He said, you, you could yell at the top of your lungs if you were close enough to it, and the person next to you couldn't even hear you. It was, just, it was just amazing. She had a God experience that day. And that's the, the voice and the power of God's Word. Verse 16, In his right hand he held seven stars, and out of his mouth came a sharp double-edged sword. His face was like the, shining in all, the sun shining in all its brilliance. Now, here we got this, this number seven again. I read it in the beginning, the seven spirits, which represent the fullness of God, all of his uh, power, his ability to see, his omnipresence, his omnipotence, all of that, uh, the fullness of God. Here we see it, another seven, and we're talking about uh, seven stars. And uh, he holds these seven stars in his hands. And here's this number again. Now, I love the fact that sometimes Scripture 
interprets Scripture. I love that because that way you don't get twisted all around. I know in some of the parables that Jesus told, uh, his disciples would come. That was a great sermon, preacher, but what does it mean? You know, I, I love that about the disciples, the truth of it. And so Jesus would say, okay, well, here's what the sower is, and here's what the seed is, and he would tell them. Well, here's one of those instances he's going to tell us what it means. And in verse 20, he says, The mystery of the seven stars that you saw in my right hand and the seven golden lampstands is this. The seven stars are the angels of the seven churches. And the seven lampstands are the seven churches. So let's break it down, this word angel. Okay, what does it mean? What does he mean that he's got seven stars? Well, and, and it's, it's, it's the word angel. And the word angel comes from, it's a compound Greek word. You know, you guys hate Greek, so don't go to sleep real quick. Ev, angel. Two words, ev, angel, um, is my title here is an evangelist. Did you realize that I'm an angel? Not only am I an angel, I'm a good angel. And that's what Ev means. Ev means good, and angel means messenger. And so you've got a good angel as your preacher. Aren't you happy about that? Um, but an evangelist is one who brings the good news. And so you can be an angel too. How many of you want to be angels? You can be an angel. All you got to do is share the gospel of Jesus Christ and you enter the league of good angels, good messengers. And so that's really, the word has a double meaning. It can mean a literal angel, but it can also mean a messenger. And so the seven stars are the preachers and the teachers, the elders and the evangelists, those who hold the message of the gospel in their hands and share it. And here's the good news. When you share the gospel, Jesus has you in his hands. And, and it's a fearful thing sometimes in this world, isn't it, to share the gospel? Because you feel intimidated by the world and the way the world treats us. And you, oh, I'm scared. I don't want to tell them about Jesus. They're going to call me some kind of right-wing nutcase. They're going to put me in some camp and I don't want to be there. Fear not. Because when you share the gospel, the good news, Jesus has you in his hands. And you're doing his will. And then out of his mouth came a double-edged sword. The sword was the weapon of Rome and it represented power and authority. It's a picture that helps us see that Jesus has final authority. The world respects power that comes out of the end of a gun. Jesus has ultimate power that comes out of the mouth of Christ. Verse 16, his face was like, continues, his face was like the shining, in, sun shining in all its brilliance. Glory pours out of Jesus. Now I tried, look, I looked online for some images that could potentially help me see and maybe help you see some image of what Jesus looks like in his resurrection, but all of it fell short. I, it's sort of like the Apostle Paul. He, he, he spoke of one who was taken up into heaven and, and, and he couldn't even explain uh, the things that he saw. And, and you just got to let, let, your, uh, let your, the Holy Spirit, let the Word of God and your uh, a mind and, and imagination take you to that place. But he is glorious. He's so radiant that it's like light pouring uh, out of him. And, and I know that the, uh, the closest uh, disciples had a glimpse on the Mount of Transfiguration of the Shekinah glory of God as it poured out of Jesus when his, his clothes became uh, as white like raiment. It was, just, it was just unbelievable, beautiful. And here it is, this picture of the glory that pours out of Christ. Like one walking out of darkness into full sunlight we're almost blinded by his radiance. And when John sees this vision, here's how he reacts. Hey, Jesus, it's great to see you, old buddy. Oh, no. He didn't act like that at all. He fell. He fell when he saw him at his feet as though 
dead. Now, you got to remember, this is John writing. Jesus ascended in 37 A.D. It's been 50 years. I want you to get this. It's been 50 years since John laid his eyes on Jesus. When Jesus was on the earth, John was one of his closest friends. John was the disciple, the Bible says, whom Jesus loved. John knew Jesus so well and felt so comfortable around him that at the Last Supper we see John actually reclining and his head is actually lying against the chest of Jesus. Now, is that intimate? Is that close? Is that personal? I love it. But now, this revelation of Christ in all of his splendor washes over John like a tidal wave, and he falls down on the ground with his face in the ground because he can't even look at him. And this is not the picture of the gentle Jesus with children bouncing up and down on his laps. This is Jesus that speaks with Niagara thunder. He blazes with supernova brilliance. This Jesus is so huge, he could play kickball with the planet Earth. This Jesus is clothed in glory and splendor, strength and majesty, power and authority. He reigns supreme and he will tolerate no rivals. But wait. Let me close with this thought. When I saw him, I fell at his feet as though dead for 50 years. Get this, folks. The faithful of the Lord, hear me. Hear me. For 50 years, John had been faithful to Jesus. He shared the gospel. He fought temptation. He took up his cross daily. He loved God and he loved people. He did not compromise his calling out of love of Jesus. He watched, and in those 50 years of his fe- he saw, he, uh, and in those 50 years, each of his fellow apostles died for a world that was not worthy of their sacrifice. John saw all that. And here, exiled for his faith, he sees with fresh eyes the resurrected Christ in all his glory. The veil was lifted, and the sight of Jesus was more glorious than his soul could take in. He was faithful. But get this. At that moment, Jesus reached down and touched him. He put his hand on his shoulder. And that was a familiar hand. That was a hand that he knew and that he loved and that he longed for that touch. And he had been faithful all this time and now he receives that touch. The Bible says, and he placed his right hand on me and said, do not be afraid. I am the first and the last. I am the living one. I was dead, and now look, I am alive forevermore. And I hold the keys of death and Hades. Write therefore what you have seen, what is now, and what will take place later. In an instant, with one touch, The past 50 years, with all its ups and downs, made sense. Are you hearing me, faithful? All of what you have endured, all of the things that you've seen, the people you've seen come and the people you've seen go, the people, uh, the things that you've endured, all of it's going to make sense in an instant. And you're going to realize, and maybe you already do, that it's all really worth it and listen i'm not talking about working your way to heaven but what i'm saying is jesus and heaven are worth our very best let's be faithful to the very end let's not compromise who we are in christ jesus let's continue to stand for righteousness and truth take comfort in this and for the churches in asia minor Shot through at this time with worldliness, the point was clear. 
Be warned, as Matt Proctor wrote, Jesus is not a kingly, a kindly grandfather who tussles our hair when we misbehave and says, well, boys will be boys. Jesus is not smiling buddy who winks at our sin and lets us do whatever we want. He is a towering, furious figure who will not be managed. He is Lord. And he is in the midst of his church. He knows our weakness. And he is big enough to do something about it.